All right, I think we still have some folks trickling in, but we'll go ahead and get started. So I'll say good morning and good afternoon to everyone based on which time zone you're in. My name is Luke Hansen, and I am a program manager here at the University of Alabama School of Public Health's Office of Public Health Practice. And I'm very excited today to welcome you to our webinar, Predicting Human Disease Risk from Animal-Borne Pathogens with Dr. Barbara Hahn. Uh, this webinar is going to be made possible by the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control, Training and Technical Assistance, or ARC-IPC for short. Just a little bit about the ARC-IPC. It was established to meet consultation and support service needs surrounding infection prevention and control throughout the state of Alabama. The center is a collaborative effort of the Alabama Department of Public Health's Infectious Disease and Outbreaks Division and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The ARC-IPC provides training and technical assistance to infection prevention and control and public health professionals in areas needed to detect, respond to, control, and prevent infectious disease outbreaks. You can go ahead and learn more about the center, uh, view and listen to past trainings, webinars, and podcasts, request your own training and technical assistance, and or view infection prevention and control resources at our website, and that's uab.edu slash ARC-IPC, and you'll see that throughout today. Uh, you can also email us at arcipc at uab.edu with any questions uh, or to stay up to date on future trainings. And you can also sign up for our newsletter on the homepage of our website. Um, so email or signing up for our newsletter are both ways to stay in touch with what we've got going on. I want to give a quick shout out to our co-sponsors for today's webinar. That's going to be the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety, as well as the Region 4 Public Health Training Center. And you can learn both. Uh, you can learn more about both of those great organizations and their programs through the websites listed here. Really quickly, I want to let you all know about our next webinar that's coming up. That's going to be with Dr. Stella Aslavekian, and it's going to be on the mystery and epidemiology of long COVID. That'll be held on September 29th at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we'll have more details coming out on our website and in a news blast shortly. Uh, we also want to make you aware of an upcoming free training opportunity for anyone that works in infection prevention with nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. So the ARC-IPC ARC -IPC will be sponsoring an infection prevention boot camp for long-term care facilities, and that'll be on October 20th and 21st in Hoover, Alabama, which is located just a few minutes outside of Birmingham. There'll be a lot of great topics covered here, including the foundation of an infection prevention program in a long-term care facility, SARS-CoV-2 and ways to minimize transmission and horizontal transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and other infectious diseases, as well as antibiotic stewardship and diagnostic stewardships. We'll also send out more information about this event and how to register in the next couple of weeks. Do want to let you know that continuing education credits have been approved for nurses by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety for this program. And to receive those credits, you need to register for the training, watch the entire program, and complete the evaluation following the program. Upon completion of that evaluation, you'll be redirected to the Alabama Nursing CEU request form, which you'll also need to complete. CEUs are going to be awarded by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety, and so you don't need to submit directly to the Alabama Board of Nursing. And those CEUs for this program will expire on July 27th, 2023. Uh, just a quick technical check-in. If you have any issues, please go ahead and email us at archipc at uab.edu. Um, we'll put this email in the chat box. And if you have tech issues, but you can reach out, uh, we'll get to those very quickly. And so lastly, and most importantly, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Barbara Hahn. She's a disease ecologist at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in New York. She completed her PhD at Oregon State University, go Beavers, during which time she also completed a Fulbright Fellowship in Venezuela. Dr. Hahn then went on to complete consecutive postdoctoral fellowships in biological informatics with the NSF and machine learning with the NIH at the University of Georgia. Her research program at the Cary Institute develops predictive analytics of zoonotic diseases and is supported by grants from the NIH, NSF, and DARPA. So with that being said, Dr. Hahn, it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to you and we all look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thank you so much for all of you joining me and sharing part of your afternoon with me. I'm so um, excited to be here to share some of my uh, the way that we've been thinking about animal-borne infectious diseases, a topic which has sort of um, bulldozed us in the past couple of years, but has always been an increasing issue, um, at least since the 1980s. We know that it's been increasing in frequency in human populations. My background, just to give you a little bit of insight to where I'm coming from, I, um, like Luke said, I did my PhD at Oregon State University, and my, my doctorate is actually in zoology. 
um, it's not a degree that's very common anymore, but we really focus on sort of the fundamentals of what makes animals tick and um, the ecology. So describing where they are, where they are, why they are where they are, and um, how, how they're able to live in the environments that they're in. Why do we find them there? How many of them are there? Why are there so many and why are there so few? These sort of basic questions that help us to understand the world around us from an animal um, perspective. And so with that being said, my, my PhD was mostly in behavior of animals and um, whether infection causes these animals to behave differently and whether that translates to animals being able to transmit or not transmit infectious diseases efficiently. Um, and so it was sort of natural to roll that into these questions about um, animals coming into contact with humans animals carrying diseases that are of high consequence to humans, and what does that mean for transmission? What does that mean for human risk? So that's sort of a two-second two background on, on me. Um, and so I'll just dive right in here, if I can get this to advance. There we go. The way that we've been sort of thinking about risk, um, we laid it out in a paper a couple of years ago, and I've been sort of referring to this as the risk scape. Um, and typically what we find ourselves responding to as a society is this emergency zone, right? Where we have an outbreak and it's starting to appear as though it's gonna be hard to control. It's gonna cross borders really easily. And we need to come up with an emergency, maybe even a global response to contain and minimize damage control, doing some damage control. And so in this emergency zone, it's really important to contain um, as quickly as possible and bringing all of our sort of arsenal to bear on putting out the fire fast. Um, and so, of course, this, you know, necessitates that there is a fire, the fire is about to get out of control, what do we do to stop it? And the kinds of information that you might need in order to do that well come from different places. We wanna be able to now cast, not just forecast, but forecast maybe like a week or two in advance, even a month in advance so that we can be ready with supply chains and things. We wanna be able to understand like how many people are dying and whether that's due to hospital beds or, um, or res resource limitations and how you move things around to better fight the fire. Now, when we're not in an emergency zone, um, we are then focused on trying to make headway in understanding why these diseases tend to break out and where they might happen next. And so that's what we call the warning, uh, the warning phase, where um, we're dealing with diseases that have names. Uh, they, they often have genetic sequences. We sort of understand how they're transmitted, although it's quite shocking how little we understand about diseases that have been around for a very long time, like Ebola. I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. Um, but in this phase, really what we're doing in the peace time is um, trying, to, trying to just build our understanding so that when we have a disease that does break out on the landscape, we know how to better respond to that. Um, now, the work that we've been doing and the, the perspective that I bring to this risk scape is really upstream. I'm interested in this watch phase. And in this watch phase, what we want to do is um, try to understand what is it about the environment itself and the players in that environment, meaning the plants, the animals, the climate, the people that are on that landscape. What is it about the, 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 those patterns that help you to better predict where to expect these fires to crop up in the future and how to prevent them from even becoming a problem? Um, now, this can be kind of a tough sell, right? Like, do you make investments in gathering data that could be useful in preventing these things from ever happening so that if you're super successful at this kind of prediction and risk mitigation, you should not see diseases crop up on the landscape ever. Um, I mean, that's the dream, right? Um, but it can be a little bit difficult to, to show the value of those connections, um, why, is, why it's important for us to understand the animals and the climate and the environment ahead of these, these sort of crises um, to, to make upstream prevention a reality. And so hopefully I'll be able to impart some of our um, feelings about that through this talk. Um, so the roadmap for today's, for what I wanna talk to you about today is really to showcase how we've been using information, data, using data from multiple different um, streams and bringing machine learning and AI approaches to bear on those data. Um, really to be able to make predictions about like particular species that might give us the highest risk of infection spillover. Um, and so I'll give you some examples of how we've been able to successfully do that um, using rodents as a general group, 
Um, and also bats and, and Ebola and Marburg and other filoviruses as a second example. Um, machine learning can also be combined with other modeling approaches um, to try to understand how we expect these diseases to move into over time in these different animal groups. And so I'll give you a short example about how um, that modelers tend to think about systems and model them and try to make sort of sensible predictions about what to expect from different animal groups and different diseases over time. And then finally, I'm going to end by giving uh, an example of what happens when we don't have a lot of data to go on. You can't really make predictions if you don't have data, right? Um, and that's what we found ourselves in, uh, found ourselves working with in terms of SARS-CoV-2. We didn't have a lot of data to go on. What can we, what can we do in those situations to um, leapfrog ahead and sort of um, shift the paradigm and how we how we think about combining these data streams to add value to our prediction efforts? Now, because a lot of the work that I'm talking about today relies on these machine learning methods, I thought it might be useful to give you just like a really brief primer on what I'm talking about with respect to machine learning. I think it's a term we hear about a lot in um, you know, the day-to-day. -day. It's become really mainstream. We talk about um, AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning all the time, and we might not have a clear understanding of what that is. And so I was going to start by giving you just a really brief overview of what I'm talking about when I say the words machine learning and what does that mean in context of AI. So you don't have to really pay attention to the details in this slide, but I just want to point out that there are some really broad areas in which that would that combined to um, inform this larger field of artificial intelligence, which is, is a field that aims to bring together these multiple approaches with the goal of mimicking intelligent human behavior, not just identifying patterns, but understanding what is it about those patterns that is suggestive of what to do next um, without explicitly being programmed to know what to do next. So that's sort of getting at this intelligent, um, artificially intelligent behavior. Now, in order to get to this, you know, big goal of AI, um, it entails uh, extracting relevant knowledge from various kinds of data, and data can come in multiple forms, right? We can have um, data that are pictures, um, data that are written down, so that's the realm of natural language processing. If any of you guys are familiar with automated transcription software, um, that is exactly what that's, that, that's doing. It's, it's natural language processing. I'm sorry, that's speech to text, but natural language processing is just like written text on a on a page um, and training the model to be able to extract meaning from the written words on a page. Speech to text is that automated transcription, um, vision, computer vision, computer robotics. Um, there's a, a big part of this feeds into like self-driving cars. Um, and then, uh, you know, other areas like robotics and ex expert systems. So all of these types of data streams feed into this holy grail of creating artificial intelligence. Now, uh, machine learning is a really big component of this because it's really the the part of this framework that um, extracts the knowledge and then develops the reasoning from that information. And it's um, the learning, the, the machine is learning and improving from experience, that experience being the data without explicit being programmed to do that. Um, machine learning is um, it has a couple of main branches. And again, these um, are just algorithms that you might be familiar with if you're used to working with these methods. But really, there's like a couple of different ways that you can train a machine to help you understand patterns better. One is that you can um, you can just give it a bunch of data that are of the same kind and, and take an unsupervised approach, which is that you don't have an answer. You just want to know what the clusters are. You want to know how the data group out together and how the groupings are different from each other. Um, that's one way to understand unsupervised learning. The method that we're going to be talking about mostly today is the supervised learning, where um, the researcher is imparting some domain expertise and knowledge and allowing the machine, telling the machine, here is uh, here is a confirmed instance of one category A, and I want you to tell me how category A is different from category B. That's one way that supervised machine learning can be set up. So you're supervising it. You're giving it an answer, and you're saying, I want you to tell me how these answers are different from these and maximize the accuracy with which you're able to distinguish between two groups. Um, that's one way to understand supervised learning. There's lots of different flavors of it, but that's, um, that's basically the flavor we're talking about today. And then there's this cool category called reinforcement learning, where you assign a reward to the machine for getting it closer to the endpoint that you want, and then you assign penalties for 
it getting it wrong. And so it's able to learn how best to achieve some end goal. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen those uh, um, animations where you start out as a quadruped and what are the evolutions that need to happen in order for the quadruped to go, become bipedal and start to run. Um, and it's really interesting to see how quickly the machine is able to um, figure out the most efficient way, uh, the most efficient uh, movements that a human body would need to make in order to actually run efficiently. Um, so that's an example of reinforcement learning. Okay, so how are all of these machine learning approaches useful for understanding zoonotic disease? Um, to dig into that question, I'm going to give an example from the rodents. Now, um, this is a map that we've created to depict the global distribution of at the time, the 244 rodent species that we knew were carrying between one and 12 different zoonotic diseases. Now, we decided to start with rodents because they're, they kind of have a bad reputation of carrying a lot of infectious diseases. And we thought, you know, if they have a bad rap, let's try to see if we can train an algorithm to distinguish the ones that do carry infectious diseases from those that don't. Is there something that we can, um, like a caricature that we can identify about the ones that do carry things? Um, now, these red zones in this map depict areas where the where multiple of these uh, infectious um, rodent reservoirs are overlapping in space. Um, so where you see red is like, you know, you have between up to 20 different species overlapping in the reddest spots. In addition to information about where these rodents are distributed around the world, we also have some information about their intrinsic biology and about their ecology. These are characteristics, some of these are listed here, these are not all of them, but they kind of fall into these categories um, for the most part. You know, things that describe their size, how big do they get at the maximum size that they get as adults? Um, you know, how large are their babies and are, are their pups? And, you know, how many litters do they have in a year? Um, if you look at these kinds of features at, together, they're really the kinds of features that if you and I were to go out and survey like, you know, 10 different rodent species and kind of just observe their behaviors and where they live and what they're eating and how many lit litters they're having, it really gives us the snapshot of um, their strategy for living life, their ecology, their biology, their physiology. Now, um, this multidimensional perspective is really important for, for us to know about because um, they give us a snapshot for how the organism has, organism has evolved over millennia to contend with lots of selection pressures, including the perpetual selection pressure of parasites and pathogens. So if you're an organism, you're trying to persist as a, as a species, as a population in um, an environment that has its own stressors, so food limitations and um, predators and things, and also parasites and pathogens that are really trying to overtake your resources for their own fitness. Um, so these characteristics give us a holistic understanding of how these organisms are able to persist and how they've evolved to contend with these selection pressures like parasite um, infections over time. Now, like I said before, we're trying to train a machine learning algorithm to see whether it can distinguish and correctly classify all of the 2,277 species into two groups, those that carry diseases and those that don't, and whether that is even doable. Like, can the machine do that just based on these kinds of characteristics that are intrinsic? Um, the other cool thing about these data that um, I should point out is that when we talk about public health and epidemiology, um, we're really usually talking about humans. And humans are um, subject to the biases that are inherent in our social systems and our, you know, the GDP in, in countries really affects the health of the, of the citizens of that country. And so it also affects how diseases are expected to influence those people. Now, the, the, that's a kind of bias that we just have to keep in mind when we do epi studies. But when we're talking about intrinsic features like these, um, they are not subject to the same kinds of human biases, right? So we wouldn't expect rodents in the United States to be really well fed and maybe obese and uh, suffering from a different suite of um, metabolic conditions. We, um, these animals have really evolved in a tight relationship with the environment and over, over evolutionary time. And so this, the, this, the traits that they are exhibiting are traits that are sort of um, not static, but static and with the purposes of um, our timeline. Like they're not gonna change next year. They're still gonna probably have the same number of litters 
it, over the next hundred years. So they're relatively stable and they're relatively immune to the kinds of biases that we expect to see in epi data from humans. Okay, so these data though, even though they're great in many ways, um, including being um, relatively free from the, those kinds of biases, they do have their issues, right? They're usually incomplete. We don't have complete data for everything. Um, they're interacting in hidden ways, um, and there's there's outliers, there's animals that act super weird and different, and they have like way more litters than you expect them to for their size. Um, there's all kinds of collinearities and things that uh, we have to deal with. Machine learning has um, one of the reasons why this method has been attractive to me and others is because it offers some solution for solutions to these statistical issues that we've had to deal with as ecologists over time. Um, and some of the newer methods um, deal with these particular outstanding issues. Um, I don't know if you guys signed up for this webinar in order to get a primer on the actual algorithm, but I'm going to give you a cartoonified version of this so that you kind of have a sense for how the machine is working. Like, how is it actually taking the data? What is it doing with it? Um, so here's my cartoon version. Um, you can imagine that the algorithm is randomly selecting from, you know, those 80 plus variables that we're getting it, and it lands on body mass at the top. And it says, okay, well, out of all of the species that I have information about, you know, the reds and the blues, the ones, the reds are, no, they're not, they're not hosts for anything zoonotic. And yes, they are hosts for one or more zoonotic diseases. So they're trying, it's trying to separate reds from blues. It has some answers. Um, it has some reds or has some blues to learn from. And it takes body mass and it splits the two into two groups um, based on its, its goal is to homogenize or make the same everything that's in group one from group two. And it does that and it splits it into two groups, things that are under a kilogram and things that are over. And now it makes recursive splits based on other randomly selected variables from that 80 that we gave it. So it might be geographic range, sexual maturity, what age it reaches sexual maturity, and so on and so forth. It develops a tree, um, a classification and regression tree that is a couple of layers deep and um, you know does okay at classifying. It's not like awesome. So it, it, using this sort of very simplistic recursive splitting approach, it is able to correctly classify reservoirs from non-reservoirs with about 64% accuracy. So like not something you want to like make decisions based on. But we can improve this. If you take one tree and you add a second one in which the second one is really maximizing its efforts on getting the wrong answers correct, you can build a second tree. That tree does the same process, randomly selects variables and splits them into two groups. Um, now its classification accuracy is increased to 71%. Now you can imagine if you were to take one tree that's 64% accurate and you build a thousand trees, and you rent, you consider them together as an ensemble, that one weak learner combined with multiple hundreds or even thousands of weak learners together as an ensemble makes an incredibly powerful um, predictive algorithm. Now, using this general approach, which is, you know, pretty simple, it's, it's not as simple under the hood, but, um, you know, in, in principle, it's a pretty simple approach. Using this algorithm, we were able to train the model to correctly classify zoonotic reservoirs of rodents with 90% accuracy. And that's just on the basis of the traits, just those traits that I showed you examples of before. Now, this is pretty cool. Like it can just look at the features of an animal that biologists have described for decades and be able to tell you with 90% accuracy, which ones are likely to be carrying diseases. But the cooler thing is that it can then tell you out of the ones that we have not observed yet, that we have not really surveilled or um, you know done any things that are understudied, we can it can identify the species that should be reservoirs for zoonoses that currently we say don't carry anything. So it gives you a rank ordered list of which species are the most likely to carry diseases that have not yet been observed. And you can imagine how powerful that is as a surveillance prioritization tool. If we have over 2,000 species, or even just in the Congo Basin, if we have thousands of species present there, and they each have their own ecologies, you can't just walk into the forest and like hope to hope to find a couple. You got to like target your approach to find the species that you think is the most useful in terms of giving you information about the reservoir. Um, and this tool gives us a way to do that. Now. Um, when we mapped um, the species that the algorithm predicted should be reservoirs, here's what we found. I'm just showing you the top couple here for, for brevity. Um, here's the total, the, the big map. This is like, um, I think in the 90th percentile, the species that were predicted within the 90th percentile to be carrying um, 
a, a zoonotic disease. And the red areas are where multiple of these species are overlapping. So you can see there's a hotspot here in the, in the, um, in the United States, which is always interesting for people who live in that area. They want to know what species there are. So I identified what species are were the highest ranking in that area, and that included um, Onychomus leucogaster. Um, it's a species that we know now carries plague. It's flea-borne um, pathogen and Bartonella um, vectored by uh, fleas and mites. Um, and there's there was another species in this area, Microtus montanus, um, Oh, the, I didn't show a, piece, a picture of it, but Microtus montanus is another species here that um, that also carries Babesia, which is tick-borne. Um, now, on the other side of the world, um, this one ranked the highest. Um, there were a bunch that ranked in this region, but this one seemed to be the most widespread. It uh, Microtus gregalis. Um, it's very widespread. It it carries something called OMS, OMS hemorrhagic fever, which is a tick-borne flavivirus. So, flavivirus are things like West Nile and Japanese encephalitis. Um, now, West Nile, yellow fever, dengue, those are all mosquito-borne flaviviruses, but there's a whole group of tick-borne flaviviruses, which are comparatively very understudied and often are carried by rodents um, and other animal groups. Um, this species always also carries plague, plague strains that are carried by fleas. Now, um, in addition to providing us some surveillance targets, the algorithm kind of gives us a couple of the, it tells us how the different variables, how useful they are in its ability to correctly predict. What are the most important features that help you get the predictions correct? And I'm just showing you the top couple here. Um, one of the most important ones that I haven't pictured here has to do with biodiversity. Um, the algorithm identified that rodent reservoirs were most likely to occur in places that had low mammal diversity. And if you think about ecology, um, Areas where that are depopulated species are typically places that have been, you know, bulldozed or deforested or otherwise changed by human behaviors. Um, and the species that tend to be left over are those that, uh, you know, have a certain life history strategy. They can proliferate quickly, and they're sort of cosmopolitan. They are happy to coexist with humans and persist in human-dominated settings. Um, and those are the types of places where rodent reservoirs tend to most likely be found, according to the algorithm. Um, in addition to that, there were several life history characteristics, and you don't have to worry about the, the graphs themselves, although I'm happy to answer questions about them later. But essentially what these figures are showing is a sort of caricature of what a rodent reservoir is likely to look like. They tend to reach sexual maturity relatively early compared to other rodents. They tend to have large litters, so more than four pups in a litter. Um, they tend to weigh greater than 220 grams, and so for uh, for reference, I've I posted a picture of an Australian wood rat, which is about 220 grams, so something larger than that. Um, and they tend to have pups that are about eight grams um, or, or greater, and that's exemplified by, by a baby red squirrel. Now, these are all different species, but I've just exemplified the ones that capture the feature that is um, that is being suggested by the algorithm, but it sort of collectively suggests this kind of uh, a rodent is more likely to be a zoonotic reservoir if it has a live fast, die young strategy in which they are maximizing the allocation of their resources to put out litters quickly um, with high frequency and over a relatively short lifespan compared to the other rodents that um, we're comparing them to. Now, um, this, this signal that was given to us by the algorithms made a lot of sense in context with the studies that have been conducted on individual species for individual pathogens. Um, but of course, it's hard for ecologists to um, zoom out often. If you're looking at one pathogen in one field system and doing experiments to understand its biology, um, combining that picture that you receive from one study with similar studies across lots and lots of species globally to get this bigger picture of what is a rodent reservoir look like um, is a really powerful thing that machine learning can do for us. So that's one example. Um, we did this for rodents and pretty quickly we realized that the features that the machine was identifying as the most important for getting prediction right were these things that also really impact population dynamics. So what I mean by population dynamics is just how many animals there are over time for particular species. So um, things that live fast and die young 
often also have these sort of population booms and then they go down. Um, this is, I'm caricaturizing it here a little bit, but you know, these, these boom and bust cycles of populations tend to occur in species that have this live fast die young strategy. And that's in contrast to things that are really large, um, long lived, slow, slow, slower metabolisms, don't have as many litters. You don't expect those to reach super high numbers and then crash. Um, there's an exception to every rule, but in general, those are the two ends of the spectrum. Now, um, we wanted to know, you know, what, what is it about these features that, what more can we extract from these features to help us make a prediction? Um, for some of these traits, it's intuitive that, would, that they would combine to drive population dynamics. And so what we wanted to do next was um, to, to take these features and put them into a model. Um, I'm just gonna walk you through this quickly. You don't have to pay attention to the details, but essentially what we're doing is saying, okay, well, we have these features that we know control how many of an animal exists in a population at a given time and how that changes over time. So we have a picture of the dynamics. Um, we're gonna fill in the blanks um, for, for species that we don't have perfect information for based on the information that we have for all of the other species and their evolutionary relatedness. So we're imputing all of these values that are missing. And then we uh, build a, a mathematical model. So what this model is basically trying to do is to say, okay, for, for a given species, if you tell me what its litter size is, what its maximum longevity is, and um, you know how large the population density we can expect it to be, and whether it's social or not, I can kind of tell you what the size of the population is gonna be over time, and when it reaches an equilibrium, where that equilibrium is gonna fall out. You can do this for every species that you have data for. And so that's what we did. We took all of these features that we know control population dynamics, constructed a model that's pretty classical in disease ecology, and said, okay, give us the population dynamics for all of the species. And so we did that. Um, and we also said, well, if a population is really dense and it reaches that density really fast, but then it crashes, the implications for transmission of infectious diseases is also very different. If you are an animal that lives very slowly and never reaches a dense population and you're really spread out, the kinds of disease, the kinds of diseases that you're going to carry are going to be different. And the way that you transmit that infection is probably going to be different. It's not going to be a density dependent thing. Like you're not going to just cough on cough on your neighbor because you probably don't have neighbors if you're asocial. Com in contrast, a species that is highly social reaches high population densities might be expected to have a higher prevalence of pathogens that are transmitted directly um, by contact with fecal matter, contact with droplets from nasal passages and things like that. We were interested in that latter category. We wanted to know which species reached high population densities, lived fast and died young, and were infected by the kinds of pathogens that are transmitted in that way, that are transmitted really as a function of density. So when we did this modeling, we, create, we also calculated mean prevalence. What is the prevalence you would expect that population to reach? And then we divided the species according to where we might find them um, around the world in different uh, ecozones. And the model identified um, some really interesting, um, some really interesting differences. Um, the so the the rug here is the number of species, and there's a couple of um, outliers that I've circled in red and blue. The red species are confirmed reservoirs, and autom automatically you can see that the red species are reaching super high mean prevalence. Um, if you were to just train a toy model to tell you what the prevalence is going to be for that population, just by virtue of its uh, intrinsic biology, it's able to support pathogens at a super high prevalence. These blue species um, are not currently known to carry any zoonotic diseases, but their trait values do suggest that their disease dynamics could lead to very, very high mean equilibrium prevalence values. And so as people, if we're thinking about um, pathogens that are likely to be transmitted to us, from rodent species that reach really high densities, the kind that we tend to find in close proximity to human dwellings, um, we, are, we can start to connect dots between what species have that feature profile that is of highest risk to humans and where are they located and where are the human communities that we would expect to be at highest risk from infection from those types of animals. We can do a simple mapping exercise to answer that question and try to connect dots between known diseases that are still, for which we still don't have a great understanding of what the reservoir species is likely to be because they're often occurring in very biodiverse settings where it's really hard to get a handle on which species are posing the highest risk. Um, and I'm just gonna zoom in on a couple of examples for brevity here. And um, the first example is monkeypox. 
So the monkeypox reservoir in the wild is still relatively undercharacterized. It has not been well studied over time. It's been one of these pathogens that, you know, when it uh, emerges, it's a big deal. Um, and then it goes away and it's not a big deal. It's sort of this, um, it, it has its own boom and bust funding and research interest cycle. Um, and so it's been relatively understudied. And of course, now it's under scrutiny. The reservoir remains relatively unknown, but according to the model outputs, um, the characteristics of this particular species, this um, striped grass mouse, seem to fit the profile of something that can reach really high mean prevalence, and its range pretty much exactly overlaps um, the range of where monkeypox has been historically observed as a natural spillover event. So this is a different kind of spillover than what we're seeing now, um, which, you know, it's a, it's a totally different transmission mode that is happening in many more uh, regions than, than historically. But historically, here's where the, the spillovers have occurred from wildlife to humans. We don't know which wildlife the model suggesting that this species fits the bill. It is currently uh, still understudied. This species, I think when we looked in the literature last, I think last year I looked and there were maybe four individuals of this organism that had ever been surveyed for monkeypox. And of course, all of them are negative because four out of pretty much all of Sub-Saharan Africa is basically almost no, no samples at all. Um, so the surveillance efforts here are, are still lacking, but people are starting to um, focus surveillance on the species. Um, there's another group of pathogens, the hemorrhagic fevers in the, um, in the neotropics here in Brazil and Central, Central America, um, South America that um, are of interest. Um, and here I'm just focusing on two. Um, this common cane mouse outlined in purple is a confirmed reservoir for Venezuelan hemorrhagic fever, and it had one of the highest prevalences predicted by our model. Um, our model also predicted that this pygmy rice rat, which is whose range is I think in orange, um, should have high prevalence for this virus. Um, and they, they had indeed actually recovered a new strain of guanarito virus from this species. But to my knowledge, there have not been any follow-up studies to assess the risk from this species to humans. So it's not just that the, the reservoir has to carry the pathogen and have a high prevalence of it, but we also have to think about the transmission modes, like the, the roots of transmission from these species to humans. It may not be the same level of risk coming from an animal that's quite rare and you know only exists in, in heavily wooded areas compared to those that um, exist quite commonly with humans. The next slide here, I'm just gonna give a quick example of filoviruses. So filoviruses are Ebola, Marburg, um, and a couple of other viruses that are closely related to Ebola that have been discovered in the past couple of years. And here um, we did the same exact analysis, but this time focusing on the bats. This analysis was conducted right after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, 2015, um, 2014. Um, and we did the same sort of same sort of approach, looked at features of the bats, um, same types of features we collated from the literature and from existing databases, put them all together, trained an algorithm to distinguish the ones that had ever been tested that had ever tested bot positive using any diagnostic method for any field virus. So really a course classification of the carriers versus the non-carriers, just to try to get a sense for which bat species we should be focusing surveillance on. Because for the last 40, 50 years, we still, despite surveillance on the species, we still have no idea where it resides in the wild. So um, here again, we had the, if you look at, the, the model was able to predict within the 90th percentile, there were over 90 candidate reservoirs, um, including this Epimop species that was really closely related to another filovirus positive species, um, and the species called Carafon pumilis. This species, um, we predicted in what 2016 would be likely to carry filoviruses, and a couple of years later, it was confirmed to carry something called Bombali virus, which is a newly classified, it's a new filovirus, um, very closely related to Ebola. Um, if you zoom in on this region that I circled here on this map, there's obviously a hot zone here over um, Southeast Asia. If you zoom into this region, it's, first of all, the question that comes to mind for me is why aren't there more filovirus outbreaks in Southeast Asia? We have almost 26 different species that are in the 90th percentile probability of being likely to carry a filovirus, if not multiple, and they're, they're overlapping in range. Um, across this pretty large zone. And some of these zones have very high population densities. And so the question remains of why we're not seeing more outbreaks in this region. Um, 
Number five, the bats, as I told you, the, the algorithm gives you a rank ordered list of species that we should be focusing surveillance on. And number five on our list was this Eonycteris spilea species. And I think about six months after our paper was published, a group that had clearly been sampling the species for months and months published their finding that they found a new, um, a new filovirus in this species, and it was found with a lung tropism, which is not necessarily great news for transmission. But um, this sort of exemplifies for us that the methods, even though they generate predictions, and even though the pr predictions seem to have a high likelihood of being confirmed correctly, there is still this dissociation between the predictions being made and published and people taking the predictions and actually focusing surveillance efforts on those species. Now, the, the efforts are still a little bit disjointed and done haphazardly. And so bridging that and completing the loop from data to modeling to predictions to validation in the field that's focused on those predictions and going around and around so that we can iterate and, and constantly improve our predictions is something that I'm really hopeful will come to fruition in the next couple of years. Now, um, I mentioned before a bunch of different data types that we relied on in order for the models to make predictions. Models can't make predictions about anything if they don't have data to work with. Um, and this is particularly important if we're trying to make any progress in this watch zone. Um, if we want to do better at predicting where fires are going to occur, um, we need to learn from where fires have previously occurred and what the features are that suggest other areas where fires could occur. Um, and this is really what we're trying to aim at with um, our approaches. Now, what happens if there are no data and you get an outbreak of something that is just really understudied. You recognize it, but you don't know what else. Uh, you don't know what else is important about it because there hasn't been the effort in understanding where it resides in wildlife, how it's distributed, what other species might be reservoirs, and this is exactly the kind of scenario that we found ourselves in with SARS-CoV-2. Now, early on in the pandemic, we quickly realized that um, it looked like a, a coronavirus that was carried by bats. There was a lot of sequence evidence to suggest that it was very closely related to um, bat-borne coronaviruses. And then pretty early on in the pandemic, we had confirmation that it was found in companion animals, things like cats and dogs. And then quickly there was some zoo incidents of species testing positive in zoos. Um, so it was clear that not only had it spilled over one time from wildlife to humans, but now because it was spreading so quickly in humans, the spillback likelihood was very, very high. And if the spillback likelihood is high, not only is it a risk for animals, for example, companion animals and domesticated species, livestock, but it could also be a back and forth situation where the evolution that occurs in the animals are is it's then through contact likely to spill secondarily back into humans. And so this back and forth, which has now, of course, been realized um, in the past year. Um, so our goal here was really to try to get ahead of this. Um, when we started to work on this project, we wanted to make predictions about what species were going to be at risk for a, a, a spill back from humans to animals. And once the spill back happened among those species, which ones were going to be most likely to then create and have an infection that was productive. So not just infected and not shedding virus, but infected and shedding lots of virus to the point where it's going to tra transmit to another individual, be it another of that same species, a different species, or humans. Um, I think we're pretty familiar with this um, life cycle, but basically it's it goes really at this point from humans to animals and sometimes from animals back to humans, um, which has been confirmed for things like mink and deer most recently coming from a deer back into a human. Uh, I think the human was a hunter. Um, so this pathway is the one that we're talking about here. And we reasoned that even if we didn't have a lot of information about what other animals are likely to carry SARS-CoV-2, what we do have is uh, we can work from the understanding that in order to have any kind of infection, in order for the most the minimum barrier bar to be met for an infection to occur, you have to have binding. You have to have binding between the virus and a host cell receptor. And so really the species that we're worried about are the ones that have a receptor that looks like it could bind um, the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2. And so that's what we did. The first step to our modeling process was, all right, let's just, let's just figure out which ones have the receptor. Let's just for starters, let's figure out which ones have the receptor and how strongly the spike protein can bind. 
And if it can't bind strongly enough, then like game over for them. Like it's a species that might be exposed, but it's not gonna bind. It's probably not gonna lead to infection if it can't bind strongly. And so those we don't need to worry about. And that's basically everything underneath this gray line. We set this gray line arbitrarily based on cats because it was the species that showed the weakest binding between its version of ACE2 receptor and spike protein, but it was still strong enough to lead to an infection that you could detect. It was coming out of the, of, um, it was transmissible. It could trans, it was enough virus to transmit to another cat or potentially to a human. So we set the bar at cats and said everything above cats is suspect. We should pay closer attention to it. Now, we did this for all vertebrates. And it's really important at this point to point out that ACE2 is an incredibly highly conserved feature of vertebrates, meaning that it's found in most things with a backbone. Some version of ACE2 exists in most things with a backbone. And so suddenly we found ourselves in a situation where we have no information about SARS-CoV-2 to, we have way too many species that have the ability to maybe bind, uh, bind SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, because, because ACE2 is so highly conserved, um, it, it posed a challenge for us in terms of like subsetting the data. Like we're probably not gonna be in contact with frogs and salamanders in the same degree as we're gonna be in contact with mammals, for example. Um, there aren't really that many um, species of amphibians that are cultivated or farmed or come in close, close, close contact with humans. Um, and so we are trying to think about how to subset, subset this well. But the other thing to point out about ACE2, the reason why it's so highly conserved is because it's really fundamental to physiological pathways um, that regulate things like homeostasis. So osmotic balance in fishes. That's why fishes have a version of ACE2 that's really important. It regulates blood pressure in humans in, um, in mammals and including humans. And that's why it's so well studied in humans because it's part of this pathway that ultimately um, controls blood pressure. And so because it's so highly conserved, it should be recapitulated in the traits of these species, meaning that the traits of these animals that allow them to live and persist and succeed in these environments have to be tied into ACE2. The covariation has to be with ACE2 in mind and accommodating the influence of ACE2. So the structure of ACE2 should reflect its life history strategy and its ability to contend with these life pressure, these um, life history pressures. So that's the reasoning that we used in order to move forward with the modeling. So what we did next is said, okay, well, we should really be focusing on mammals. Most of the birds we know um, have coronaviruses are not in the same group. Um, they're not beta coronaviruses. And so let's just, let's just move on with mammals. When we break out mammals into their major groups, we have um, the hooved mammals, carnivores, bats, primates, rodents, and a bunch of other species, um, you know, things like pangolins and things. Um, the general pathway that we took to modeling, there's a lot of details here, but essentially the, the gray stepping stones are what we're doing. We have some field evidence, not a lot. We have some lab evidence, which is take it for what it's worth, right? It's sort of, um, dissociated from what's happening in the real world, but it does give you high quality data on the strength of binding. So we took all of the information that we had, made decisions about um, what to include, so subsetting it to mammals. And then we said, the first thing we're gonna do is calculate how strongly the virus is expected to bind ACE2 for that species. And then we're gonna take that value and train a machine learning model to distinguish between those that have a really strong binding and weak binding. Once we did that, we can then predict zoonotic capacity, which is how uh, likely is a species to not only become infected by ACE2, but also to, to uh, have a productive infection that transmits onward. So with those predictions in hand, we can then compare the predictions to the empirical evidence that is accumulating rapidly. Um, if opportunistically, at least they are positives that be, that are validated against our predictions. And then we can identify this species with really high spillover or spillback transmission risk for to prioritize those for empirical validation. And then we can hopefully complete this loop, hand those um, predictions off to people who are doing the field validation or doing lab experiments to check to see if we're right. Now, the modeling was um, pretty successful. We uh, were able to train a model to um, predict the zoonotic capacity with pretty high accuracy. I think uh, our model reached almost 80%. I think we're right around the 77, 78% accuracy mark. Um, and this is pretty ama amazing given that we were only using these intrinsic traits of these mammal species. And we were training them to recognize how strongly the binding was happening between the receptor and the virus. 
it identified a couple of key groups that were important potential hosts for SARS-CoV-2. Um, many species of primates, carnivores, um, rodents showed stronger binding and greater potential zoonotic capacity. It also identified several key animal species um, that were already the focus of ongoing work. So that includes the pangolins and some bat species. Now, um, this work is continuing to be validated even, even now. Um, we published this before white-tailed deer were confirmed, before the snow leopard was infected in the zoo, um, before that, actually we were finalizing the results of our model when it was public, when it was found that this Paramiscus maniculatus is deer mouse, which is very common um, in the Western US, central and Western US, um, when these species were confirmed as reservoirs, not only reservoir, but uh, not only carriers of SARS-CoV-2, but transmissible infection. So the evidence to date, and this is probably already uh, already outdated, um, given how quickly the literature is moving. White-tailed deer have been totally confirmed as transmissible infection. Deer mouse, also transmissible. Red fox was very high up on our list, and we thought to ourselves, this is not a good situation. Not only do you have the prey of red fox being infected and other community members like white-tailed deer being infected, but now you also have the mesopredator, the red fox being infected, which poses the question of well, what happens in forest communities like here in the Northeast New York, where I live, where you have all of these guys interacting in a forest community all the time. These are like the major, major players in the system. So that you know, opens up a whole universe of questions about what about the interactions and how are they gonna change? And are red fox gonna die from infection or are they just gonna continue transmitting it? Are they getting it from the mice? What does that transmission structure look like? A whole bunch of new questions that have opened up as a result of this analysis. The snow leopard was, near the top of our list of predictions and it proved to have a fatal infection. And so uh, maybe it's a productive infection, but it's so, it's reaches such high virus levels that it dies. Um, and the raccoon dog, which is invasive across most of Europe and um, you know very common species uh, also confirmed to have a transmissible infection. Now, there were a few predictions that are worth keeping an eye on. Um, the cattle and pigs, uh, the lab inoculations in the pigs um, gave us a zero. So there were the lab inoculations in the pigs did not lead to infection, even though our model and a bunch of other models that have since been published all predict that pigs should be susceptible. And the question there is why not? Why are they not susceptible to infection the way that we predict they should be? Um, and the second group is cattle. They get infected, but there's no evidence yet that they transmit it, which is good news. Um, and it's not good news that they're getting it, but it's good news that it's not a transmissible infection. It doesn't necessarily mean it'll stay that way. Certainly worth keeping track of the variants as they come out. So there's a bunch of species now that we have reasonable confidence should be targets for surveillance and future study. And the next thing we can do is try to make some um, sensible predictions about where these species are and how much of a risk they should pose to people. So let's just start by mapping them. Here's where the species in the top 10% of zoonotic capacity um, predicted zoonotic capacity for SARS-CoV-2 are distributed globally. And you can see that in some areas here, again, oops, here again in Southeast Asia, um, you see uh, you know, a, kind of a hotspot. There's up to 25 overlapping species here and also here in the Congo Basin. Um, yeah, a lot of very high species richness, but not all of these species are gonna be equal transmission risks, right? So I alluded to this before, but we have different levels of contact with these different groups of organisms. Domestic species obviously are a different kind of transmission risk than, domestic, than um, wild species. There are species that are of conservation concern in which, like great apes, for example, highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. We have evidence that they contracted in zoos. There are places where they're heavily protected, um, and yet the industry uh, depends some, to some degree on ecotourism in which um, because the, the animals are so habituated, the distance between humans and these great apes is not really that far away. So transmission is actually plausible in those situations. Um, so thinking about how to protect the animals from spill back risk from humans to them is uh, something to be focused on. And then there are human commensals. So these are the cosmopolitan species that I mentioned before. The Oidicoides uh, virginianus is a white-tailed deer, and these these the white-footed mouse was is one that's very common around here. It's also a, a huge carrier for lots of tick-borne diseases, and um, it was predicted to be high. So the human commensals in these in this in these predictions um, weigh heavily into our into our prediction uh, into our decision making about what to do next. Now let's subset by habitat use. 
not all of these species are going to be able to persist in human dominated settings. So if we just look at the ones that are able to persist in human dominated settings, here's where the prediction map looks like. Here's where those species are, are located. And then we subset again by places that um, have high COVID-19 rates. So lots of cases, I think we set it at over 100,000 cases of human SARS-CoV-2 um, at the time of publication, which was back in December um, of last year. Um, and so this is what that map looks like. So by zooming in on places where the animals exist with high risk and humans exist with lots of cases and the animals and humans have a reasonable likelihood of overlapping because of uh, animal behavior, this is what that map looks like. And we can zoom down into the species and get a sense for what species we should be focusing on as well in these different regions. So I'm just gonna show you those three maps again, just um, so that you can get a sense for how they're narrowing down. We need to prioritize the um, species at the highest risk of spillback infection and those that are um, likely to become enzoonotic reservoirs, so endemic reservoirs for SARS-CoV-2 circulation um, in perpetuity in the future. So up to now, all of the sort of upstream predictive work has remained disconnected from action for the most part and largely disconnected from activities in public health. So our perception about how to protect um, human populations from future risk of zoonotic diseases and current risk of zoonotic diseases that we know are circulating, um, those research fields are pretty disconnected, but I'm hoping um, that through talks like these and through research avenues, programs like my own and others, that there will be a little bit more bridging between those two um, disciplines that are really disconnected. I'm gonna end quickly by just um, acknowledging a lot of my collaborators and the funding for this work, and I will just wrap it up there to leave some time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. I wish we had more time um, to delve into this topic, but hopefully we can have you back here in the near future. Uh, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Please join us for our next presentation on long COVID. We'll send more information out about that shortly, and I uh, hope you all have a great day. Thank you again, Dr. Han, so much. Thank you very much. Take care.